Thank you very much for coming. Um, between the crowd tonight and the couple of hundred we had here this morning, that's an extraordinary uh, response from the parish and uh, something which we could be very grateful to God for. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, loving God, we thank you for this time of grace in our Lenten journey towards Easter. Open our minds and our hearts that we might hear again and hear afresh your truth, a way to live your life and a way to rejoice in your saving love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. I want to talk tonight about how we have a sane, sensible and uh, Catholic approach to our devotion to Mary, the Mother of God, and, uh, and how the saints help us. We need all the help we can get on the spiritu in the spiritual life, but we do need to make sure that this very particular Catholic devotion um, is one that leads us always and everywhere to Christ. More on that soon. Mary's history and Mary's reality in the church right now is a little bit complex. It either, Mary either goes from getting too much attention, and some Catholics worry me a little because they seem to give Our Lady more attention than they give Jesus himself. And of course, Mary would be appalled at that because Mary always and everywhere, and everywhere reveals and takes us to her son. And that's rock solid Catholic theology. As important and lively as our devotion to Our Lady should be, it should always be moving us on um, back to and right up and including devotion and indeed love of our Saviour. Alternatively, there's uh, no devotion at all. A lot of Catholics these days say, no, no, I'm not sure what this all means, and I don't know where it all fits or how it all works. And so devotion to Our Lady can be somewhat lacking. And some people sometimes and wrongly say that the Second Vatican Council were the reason they got rid of devotion to Mary. Well, it is true that from 1968 to 1974, the sort of devotion we had before the Second Vatican Council certainly seemed to go through an enormous transformation. That's indisputable. And I'd like us to think about the sort of devotion we had up to and in, up to probably the late 60s. From my own life, from my own parish, school, family, diocese, we can remember lots of things we used to do. There were, and in many parishes still have these things, which is fantastic. Novena to the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Children of Mary, the Family Rosary, the, family, the Rosary statue that went around parishes, the May and October altars, uh, the, the um, scapulars. Do you remember scapulars? They were big. And then we had medals, we had sodalities, the Legion of Mary, teams of Our Lady, numerous congregations of brothers, priests, and uh, nuns were devoted to one or many of the uh, uh, different titles of Our Lady. And many religious sisters, remember, had Mary in their name. Do you remember there was Sister Mary Agapanthus or Sister Mary, Mr. Agapanthus Mary? So, and we had various processions in, on Marian feast days. If you came out of a French, an Austrian, an Italian, a Portuguese or Spanish tradition, well, often they had fiestas, wonderful festivals in honor of Our Lady in one title or another. And I can remember, I'm sure it was true in the United States, it certainly was true in uh, Australia. If you went to a Catholic grade or elementary school, or high school for that matter, we used to get an extra public holiday on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception and the Feast of the Assumption. It was the best thing about going to a Catholic school. You got another couple of holidays a year in honor of Our Lady. I loved Our Lady growing up, especially around the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception. But my most affectionate memory of, uh, of devotion to Our Lady, in fact, comes from my own family. My um, father was one of nine children, the Leonards, and uh, the Leonard nine, one became a priest, and the other eight took the Lord very seriously in Genesis chapter two, when he said, go forth and multiply. I have 32 first cousins on my father's side, 32 first cousins. Some of you would have more, but I had 32 of them. And uh, our Uncle Morris is the patriarch. He was the eldest of the whole nine kids. And every single holidays for my whole childhood, Uncle Morris used to call up every one of the seven families because he had a ranch. A mag, you would call it a ranch, we called it a sheep station. He had a big sheep ranch and it was a magnificent place. And he invited all 32 cousins to come and have a holiday on the ranch. And so we used to turn up in great numbers. I think it peaked at 15 first cousins turned up for one of our school holidays. 
I didn't think of it then, but now I think now about my Auntie Claire, with all the cleaning, all the washing, and all the cooking for 15 kids. Now, you didn't go to sit under the tree and read your novel. You went to work and work hard, but we loved it. And as a result, some of my first cousins are some of my closest friends. But there are a couple of rules at Uncle Morris and Auntie Claire's place, but one of them was the nightly rosary at exactly 7.30. The reason I know it was 7.30 was because we have the national news on the equivalent in Australia of the BBC is the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, and the new national news goes out at 7 o'clock every night. At 7.30 precisely, Uncle Morris would get up from watching the news and go, Rosary, Rosary, and then the Leonards became the Waltons. <laughs> there was Jim Bob and Mary Ellen and everybody else. We'd pour out of cupboards and out of everywhere, and we'd all assemble, all, say, 16 or 17 of us, including my uncle and aunt and their children, would assemble to say the rosary. Now, Uncle Morris and Auntie Claire got married in 1948, and they had a very particular way of saying the rosary. They were so used to it. It was so in their bones, they had a very particular way of saying it. Uncle Morris used to say, How may Mingham be some jum? Now, I assume Mingham is among women, and blessed thou thou um jum was thy womb Jesus. By the time he got to Mingham, Auntie Claire would start, Hallamamamen. Hallamamamen. And she always held the holy, Hallamamamen. And of course, they were very rarely apart from each other, living on a ranch together for all of their long married life. And so every night we got They were speaking in tongues long before it was trendy. And of course, they were absolutely on the money. If you said to Uncle Morris, you're not saying the Hail Mary correctly, he wouldn't know what you're talking about. To his ear, he was saying every single word. And of course, he had it right. The rosary is a mantra prayer. You're not meant to ever think about the words, just so much of your, in your bones it is. You're meant to focus on the mystery of Christ's life upon which that decade is focused. So if you said to Uncle Morris, you're saying it incorrectly, he would think you're crazy. And indeed, you would be, because he had it right where he needed it. It was a mantra prayer. Mind you, that said, sometimes he would say, Rich, give out the second decade. And I would go, Hail Mary, full of grace. And then Uncle Morris would say, speed it up. And I'd go, how may Mingham some jum? <laughs> and you had to stay with Auntie Claire, so all of us had to say all the time, ha la ma, -ma -men. Now, fast forward some 18 years, and I'm going off to become a Jesuit. I'm about to enter the Jesuit novitiate in Sydney. And my cousin, Paul Leonard, uh, who's one of the cousins that went to these holidays as much as I did, and very close friend and cousin of mine these days, and has been all our lives, we've grown up together. Paul took me out to dinner, and we were at this frightfully posh and very expensive restaurant. Thank God he was paying. And uh, in the middle of the meal, we were recalling lots of great stories from our childhood. But just out of the blue, in the middle of the meal, Paul turns to me and says, How am I going to And I said, How am I going And it went backwards and forwards across the table for a while until our waiter asked which Eastern Bloc country we came from. <laughs> And I don't know why I said it, but I said, Kajikistan. <laughs> I'm a very proud Kajikistani, apparently. And that's the way they talk. In, if you come from Australia, that's the way we think they talk. And then we kept recalling these wonderful holidays and Uncle Morris and the Rosary and Auntie Claire. It was all great. And then he said, but Uncle Morris used to have that crazy prayer where we used to hit our chest. Now, you might remember that the rosary, family rosary, often had what we called in our family the toppings and the tailings. You know, all these prayers before the rosary and after the rosary. We had the Apostles' Creed. We had the um, Benedictus. We often had the Nuc Dimittis. We often had the prayer for the conversion of Russia. That worked. <laughs> and we might need it back. We might need it back again just now, but just quietly. Um, we had the prayer for the protection of the Pope, that worked too. So we had these wonderful prayers. Sometimes they took longer than the rosary. But Uncle Morris used to, of course, do the invocation to the Sacred Heart. Now, when we were boy cousins, we loved it if you had a boy cousin on either side of you at the family rosary, all kneeling down saying the rosary, because you remember how it used to go, we'd say, Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Sacred Heart of Jesus, 
have mercy on us. Sacred Heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Well, if the boy cousin on either side wasn't hitting his chest strongly enough, you helped him out. <laughs> Sacred Heart of Jesus, bang. Oh, have mercy on us. Now, I said, well, there wasn't anything too stupid about that prayer, was there? I said, it was a ridiculous prayer, says Paul. And then I thought to say, well, what did you think he was saying? Now, I do a very good impersonation of my Uncle Morris's very broad Australian rancher's accent. Uncle Morris used to say, Sagrada to Jesus, Sagrada to Jesus, Sagrada to Jesus, Sagrada to Jesus. For 18 years, my cousin Paul thought our Uncle Morris was saying g'day to Jesus. And you can hear it, can't you? Can you imagine a seven-year-old going to this ranch for the first time and you get it in your ear, you can, only, you can only hear it once you've got it in there. Listen to it. Say good to Jesus. Say good to Jesus. Say good to Jesus. You can actually hear it. So Paul wouldn't believe me that Uncle Morris was actually saying sacred heart of Jesus. So we, uh, there were no mobile phones in those days, so we had to call up, no cells, so we had to call up Uncle Morris. And uh, so we got Morris before he went to bed, and I said, Uncle Morris, we've just had a discussion about the family rosary, lovely stories. He said, oh, I hope you both said it. I said, well, I have. I don't think Paul has, but that's another story. And uh, I said, uh, but you know the prayer where we used to hit our chest? Oh, yes, the prayer to the say good to Jesus. And, uh, and Paul says, that's it, that's it. It's say good day to Jesus. And I said, Morris, can you just tell us, slow it down, what did you actually say? He said, sacred heart of Jesus. And Paul said, no, 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 you used to say g'day to Jesus. And we all hit our chest and said, have mercy on us. And uh, Uncle Morris said, on the, on the speakerphone, he said, Paul, you've always been an idiot. <laughs> actually, ever since when I've got to the litany of the sacred heart, I now say g'day to Jesus. I actually prefer it. I think it's lovely. But it's a tough old religion, Catholicism, isn't it? We turn up to say g'day to Jesus, and then we all go, have mercy on us, which is a bit tough, really. I think we're only turning up to say hello to Jesus. But anyway, one of the things the Second Vatican Council did was when the two and a half thousand bishops got to Rome in 1962, they cleaned up the liturgical books. And one of the things they discovered very early on was that there were uh, 396 feast days in 1962 in honour of Our Lady. It was a bit like singing Happy Birthday every single day. It starts to lose a bit of its punch, doesn't it? So they said, uh, we're going to clean up the books for all of these feast days and get back to the essentials. And what they did was then give us the 17 universal feasts, which everyone, every Catholic in the world, now celebrates. We've got uh, Mary, the Mother of God, the Presentation of Our Lord, our Lady of Lourdes, the Annunciation, Our Lady of Fatima, Mary Help of Christians, visit the Visitation, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the Assumption, the Queenship of Mary, uh, the Nativity of Mary, the Most Holy Name of Mary, Our Lady of Sorrows, Our Lady of the Rosary, the Presentation of Mary, and the Immaculate Conception. That's in order as they come during the church's year, um, or actually during the calendar year. Um, now, if you come to Mass every day, you'd know that Roughly, once every three to four weeks, we have a major feast in honour of Our Lady. So people who say, oh, they got rid of devotion to Our Lady at the Second Vatican Council are quite wrong. They came back to what we've held for a very long time in most cases and to what the whole church would celebrate anywhere in the Catholic world. They then said to bishops' conferences, if you've got Our Lady of Guadalupe or Our Lady of um, where it might be, Our Lady Help of Christians, then you might add in extra feasts on top of that. Separate to that, then there are another six feasts that where Mary is honoured indirectly. The Feast of St. Joachim and Anne, Christmas, Epiphany, the Spouse of Mary, St. Joseph's Spouse of Mary, which was just last week, the Holy Family and the Holy Innocents. St. Joachim and Anne, we don't know Mary's parents' names. They could have been Fred and Betty for all we know, but they got those names in the third century. Um, and they're beautiful Hebrew names and Mary certainly had parents, so they'll do. The scariest feast, though, there is the Feast of the Holy Innocents. This, of course, is where Herod comes and slaughters every baby under two, and Joseph, it's revealed to Joseph in a dream to take Mary and Jesus and go to Egypt. Now, Matthew's Gospel is the only one to record this event. 
These days, biblical scholars and theologians would say that's probably a theological feast more than an historical fact. Why? Because Matthew is at pains to make Jesus the new Moses, the definitive Moses. And so it's the most Jewish of the Gospels we've got in the New Testament. So just as Moses was saved as a child, aha, Jesus is saved as a child. Just as Moses goes to Pharaoh in Egypt, Jesus goes to Egypt. Just as Moses comes out and gives the tablets of the law, Jesus comes back and he is the law. The next story we hear about them coming back from Egypt is Jesus as a 12-year-old teaching the scribes and the Pharisees about the law and they're astonished at his wisdom. So we would now say that's a theological uh, feast. It's, a, it's got to be a bit careful. The problem is not that God saved Jesus. Clearly a good thing. Why didn't God warn every mother and father about Herod? What about the other two-year-olds who were slaughtered? So it can be a bit problematic. Now, I know right, understandably, the Right to Light movement has picked that up. And of course, around the Feast of the Holy Innocents, we have Right to Life Sunday or some uh, uh, other suitable occasion. Um, well, that's understandable, but we need to be a little bit careful of it. It's a theological story rather than necessarily a historical story. We have no evidence from Jewish or Roman historians of Herod slaughtering any babies anywhere. But we should know Mary in the tradition. We're Catholics and we love our tradition, but many Catholics don't know the tradition as well as they could or should. So a quick trip through our own 2,000 years. The first thing that the New Testament says to us about Mary, and boy, it's important, is she's the first disciple of Christ. The first disciple called into the kingdom and the ministry of Christ is his mother, is Mary. So we, she's also first among the saints. And then later in John's gospel, she becomes the mother of the early church the mother of the whole church, even to this day. It's in the second century that a very distinguished uh, Catholic uh, or Christian theologian called Justin Martyr said that Mary was the new Eve. And he argued that Revelations chapter 12 was all about Mary. Now, you know about that, whether you've ever read that book or not. How many people here have seen a statue, a stained glass window, or a painting where Mary has stars for a tiara and a an serpent at her foot. Hands up if you've ever seen anything like that. Okay, it's very, very common to see it. Because Revelations chapter 12 talks about the woman who has stars in her hair and the serpent at the striking down the serpent with her heel, actually. My mother tells the story that in our local cathedral when I was a boy, I was three years of age, I don't remember this, but she does, and during uh, the sermon, which must have been a bit long and boring, I wandered up to this statue of Our Lady, which was very near the pulpit. And uh, in one of a little pregnant pause during a long and tedious homily, apparently I turned around to the entire congregation and said on top note, Mary's standing on a snake, mum. She's very, very silly. <laughs> to which I think the congregation wanted to say, and also with you or with your spirit, doesn't quite work as well, does it? Um, and with your spirit, but, uh, and indeed she was silly for standing on a serpent, but it's a theological story again. Now we would say, most biblical scholars would say, the woman in the book of Revelation is not Mary. Even though we've always had statues and paintings that have her like that, why? Because a few chapters after the 12th chapter in the book of Revelation, the woman who's never named as Mary, the woman ends up the bride of Christ. Well, we think Mary and Jesus were very close, but we don't think they got married. So that's getting a bit scary. So the woman, of course, is the church. It's the church who is adorned with stars in our hair, and we're striking down evil by how we live. That's what the text is trying to say. But Justin didn't know that, and he said it was Mary, and as a result, we've been living with it ever since. It's in 235 with Hippolytus that we search here that Mary is sinless. We'll come back to why these things develop as they develop. Um, and then in the Council of Ephesus in 431, Mary gets her greatest title that was ever bestowed by the church upon her. How many people here like me have been to Ephesus in modern day Turkey? It's absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? It's well worth going if ever you get the chance. You go there for a couple of reasons. Firstly, you'd go because Ephesus is a study in climate change and uh, in even geological, geographic change. 
Ephesus used to be on the coast. It was a port city. In fact, it was one of the most import, important cities of Asia Minor in the Roman Empire. St. Paul wrote his letter to the Ephesians, obviously to Ephesus. We also think he wrote uh, the letter to the Galatians there, and we're almost certain that the Gospel of John was written there. And if ever you've been there, you'll know also there's a claim that Mary's house, her final place uh, of rest, is um, in the mountains behind Ephesus. And there's some claim for that, though the church has never said one way or the other whether it's true or not. We just don't know. But you can still make a pilgrimage to that site on the top of the mountain behind Ephesus to this day. You go to Ephesus also because it's the best Roman ruins in the world, or some of the best intact Roman ruins, even though they've had a couple of big earthquakes. This extraordinary facade of the library is there, and you start to get a sense of the grandeur of these ancient Roman cities. Most people go for that. There's a UNESCO World Heritage Site now. But when you walk into that, there's a sign that says Concilium Hall, and over to your right are just a whole lot of rocks on the ground, and that's where the Council of Ephesus met in 431. They didn't meet to talk about Mary. They met to talk about Jesus. Most Catholics and Christians think, oh, we have organized all this stuff about our whole belief in the Trinity and in our Lord or in the New Testament, certainly by the end of the first century. But that's not true. We were still fighting about how Jesus was true God and true man and if what way and what measure um, three or four centuries after our Lord. And the early councils are trying to get all the definitions right. Ephesus was called to say that Jesus wasn't play acting as a human being. He was a full and true human being and the definitive revelation of God in the world. And how they said he was the definitive or the, a true human being, he was born of Mary. So they came out and said the litmus test, the touchstone to his humanity is his birth of Mary. And so she got this extraordinary title, the Theotokos in Greek. Greek's a wonderful language, which come to us as Mother of God, 1st of January. But actually, I like the Greek. Literally, the Greek means the one who carries God, the God carrier. If you think about it, Mary's the oldest tabernacle in the world. It's a tabernacle. Isn't that a lovely way to think about carrying a baby, carrying something sacred? I think that's terrific. So we've got Mary, who is the Theotokos, the, uh, the, the mother of God, the uh, carrier of God. The other thing we know about Ephesus, actually, is a great early experience of inculturation. How many of you have ever sung a hymn where you would have a phrase like this? Star of the sea, pray for the wanderer, pray for me. Who's ever heard of the, anything like, you know, star of the sea or a parish or a school like that? Okay. We've had lots of it. Well, don't tell anybody this, but Stella Maris, the title Star of the Sea, was, had nothing originally to do with Mary. It had to do with the goddess Diana. And in Ephesus, she had her temple to the Stella Maris, the Star of the Sea. It was on the coast. It was on the port, great port city. And so when Christianity took over Ephesus, which it did in extraordinary ways in the second and third centuries, they basically hijacked the entire cult of Diana and transferred it over to Mary. Well, you might talk about Diana. She's finished and done and over. We have Mary, who is the star of the sea. Now, you didn't know that when you were singing that hymn or any of those hymns, but we've been brilliant at trying to take in local culture, domesticating it, and then making it our own. How many of you here have read Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code? Like me. Okay. Um, I'm the only priest who'll tell you this, but Dan Brown did us all a favor in writing The Da Vinci Code. For four years of my life, I spent uh, four years of my life going to backyard barbecues in Australia, where within a minute of arriving in the backyard, someone would say to me, Father, have you read The Da Vinci Code? And the next two hours of my life were spent talking about the formation of the New Testament, the baptism of Emperor Constantine, Mary Magdalene, and the formation of the Gospels. Name me another saint, doctor of the church, or pope who could get biblical history onto backyard barbecues. <laughs> now, what happened? We had a whole lot of Catholics and Christians who the last time they did any work on their own religious education was when they were 12 years of age and they were getting ready for confirmation. That's pretty well it. 
And so they read the Da Vinci Code and went, oh my God, nobody ever told me any of this. Oh, it must all be true. No, it's not even remotely true. 70% of it, shouldn't say that, that was too big a statement. 70% of it's good research, actually very good research. 30% of it is total fantasy, total fantasy. But why blame Dan Brown? He wrote a novel. You're allowed to do that in a novel. He wasn't claiming it was a theological work. He wasn't claiming it was an act of non-fiction. He was writing a novel. He's allowed to do that. But he hit a Catholic and a Christian uh, group, a community, whose religious education isn't everything that it could be. So lots of people believed it lock, stock and barrel, which is a bit of a problem. But it did help me have theological conversations for four or five years of my life. But Dan told us all a very important fact. A complete game changer for Christianity was when Emperor Constantine in 321 AD was baptised a Christian. Pretty well up to that time, we'd been a persecuted minority who were martyred for the faith, particularly under Diocletian, as you might know, slaughtered for the faith, the early martyrs. The um, story of the early church is drenched in blood, dying for the faith. And then by 321, Empress Helena I, his mother, becomes a Christian, and then Constantine, her son. Once he became a Christian, everyone in the Roman Empire, you had to be the religion of the emperor, and so everyone had to become Christian. Now, there are some interesting things that are with us to this day as a result of this. The first is, it's not by accident that Archbishop Gomez, when he comes here, wears magenta. That was the colour of the senator's togas. And in 328, the senator, the bishops of the Christian church got the status of a senator. So they started to wear magenta. And that's why bishops to this day wear magenta. I love this about our Catholic Church. We're so good at um, absolutely borrowing, stealing everything we possibly can from everything around us. The second thing is I love going into cathedrals and then in the big procession into, and you've got a glorious uh, cathedral there in downtown LA um, and famous throughout the world. Those tapestries are worth going just to enjoy those, but it is a stunning building. And when you go in, normally there's the cross, of course, there are the candles, and there are the incense. Now, people think this is terribly religious. No, it's not. It's utterly pagan, at least in its first instance. In Rome, the senators, and later, pretty well soon after, the bishops, when they went processed through the streets of Rome, they had the standard of their house out the front to tell people who was coming. Very important person. They had candles to light their way. And because the streets were latrines, they weren't the nicest thing on the nose, just quietly. So they had incense going ahead in the procession to make it a little bit more pleasant for the very important person. Well, obviously, we must smell when we go anywhere near a cathedral because they've got Father's smoking handbag out the front, still trying to make it all. Now we put new prayers on it. May our prayers rise before you as the incense. That's all good. But sometimes people will want to tell you this is all deeply religious. Well, no, it's not. And knowing this story actually means we have tried to make friends with local culture at every stage. But once, Dan, once uh, Constantine became a Christian, well, that was a game changer because no one had access to the emperor. The way you got access to the emperor was through people who took your petitions into the court and then he would send out a yes or a no. All of a sudden, if he's now worshiping uh, Christ in heaven, Christ had to be a king, an emperor in heaven. The queenship of Mary comes in. They start putting orbs and scepters and crowns and ermines and capes, and they start sitting on thrones in art. Because if the royal family in Rome are worshipping them, there must be a bigger, greater royal family in heaven. But of course, Jesus said, I'm not a king like this. My kingdom is not of this world. But that actually affected us. Because all of a sudden, we weren't worthy to come into the presence of Christ. We weren't worthy to have our petitions heard. And so you needed Mary and the saints to take your petition into the heavenly court from which it would be answered or not. This is not insignificant. It's in uh, the 6th century that the first time we hear about the Immaculate Conception. It might have been around before, but we have no record of it. And, uh, and that's because now all of a sudden people are asking more questions about uh, Mary's birth and was that miraculous. And, of course, we believe in the development of doctrine as things go on. Then we have uh, Mary falling asleep. Um, there's nothing in the doctrine dogma of the assumption to say Mary didn't die. 
She had to die. She was a full and true human being. The dogma of the assumption says she didn't know the corruption of the grave, which is a very different thing. So she, didn't, she did die. Jesus died. She died. And then in the 8th century, we have um, Mary's assumption. Again, it might have been around before, but we didn't have... A, we didn't, it was now talked about in theological circles. And then it all starts to become feasts. In the 12th century, we now have a feast of the Immaculate Conception in Lyon. And then in the 12th century, we have uh, St. Bernard of Clairvaux telling us Mary is the interceding role for us, and that's the role many of us have had for Mary in our life. And then we go to... Um, 1854, it exploded devotion to Our Lady then for the next centuries that rolled on, and Pius IX declares the Immaculate Conception to be a dogma of the Church, and then in 1950, Pius XII declares the Assumption to be a dogma of the Church, and then in 1961, the Council Fathers didn't want to do a separate document about Mary, not because they didn't like Our Lady, but they wanted to put her into the life of the Church. They wanted to make sure that she was within the community that she was the first among the saints. So it's chapter eight of the uh, constitution of uh, the dogmatic constitution on the church. And of course, what we see over this time is reflected in architecture. As the tabernacle goes up in our churches and we get altar rails and rood screens and choirs and all that stuff, it goes farther and farther back. And you, weren't, you were just not worthy to go anywhere near the tabernacle, near our Lord, who was the king of heaven. Well, who came forward? Our Lady and your own church this church is an interesting piece of architecture when you come in when you turn immediately left what do you hit Our Lady of Guadalupe so we've actually got this going in this church that's because well we weren't quite worthy to be in the presence of the Lord and we would go to a saint or go to Our Lady to come with us or go for us to our Lord what happened after the Second Vatican Council the bishops did nothing about trying to diminish the role of Mary in the life of the church, they put back the more ancient theology, which was that Jesus doesn't want us to be remote. Our brother, our saviour, our friend, that he wants us to come close. And we grabbed onto that because we knew it was right. From 1968 to 1974, particularly in our hymns, the way we're celebrating the liturgy, our sacraments, our study of the Bible, going back and reading the scriptures for ourselves. We didn't get rid of devotion to Our Lady. We put back into its central place a direct relationship with our Lord because that's what the Gospels tell us. That's what he wants. So when people say the Vatican Council sidelined Mary, they're quite wrong. That may have been a consequence to what we'd had before, but only because the more traditional, the more Catholic theology of our ability to talk to the Lord and him wanting us to be intimate was now put back in its correct uh, position where we could deal direct. We didn't need intermediaries in the same way we had for centuries before. I love this story. Talk about uh, intermediaries. Daniel went to his mother demanding a new bicycle for Christmas. Danny, you know we can't afford it, but so why don't you sit down and write a letter to Jesus and pray for one instead? So Danny sat down and wrote the following letter. Dear Jesus, I've been a good boy this year and I want a new bicycle. Yours truly, Daniel. Now, Danny guessed that Jesus actually knew he'd been a brat all that year, so he ripped up the letter, had another go. Dear Jesus, I've thought about being a good boy this year, and I want a new bicycle. He knew that was wrong too, so he ripped up that and had a third go. Dear Jesus, I've thought about trying to think about being a good boy this year, and I want a new bike. Finally, he decided to not make false um, false claims in any letter. So he jumped up, ran down to the local Catholic church, broke into the piety stall, stole a statue of Mary, came home, hid her under the bed, wrote the following letter. Jesus, let's face it, I've broken most of the commandments. I've torn up my sister's doll and lots more. I'm desperate. I've got your mother Mary held hostage. <laughs> and if you ever want to see her again, you're going to give me a new bike for Christmas. You know who. In 1974, Pope Paul said, well, how do we reclaim an intelligent, uh, Catholic, wonderful devotion to Mary? And Pope Paul VI, in Marialis Cultus, the cult of Mary on right devotion to Our Lady, says that start with the New Testament, because it's also ecumenical. For those of you here who aren't Catholic, it's wonderful you're with us tonight. Sometimes Mary is a stumbling block for people entering into the life of the church. Paul VI said in 1974, she shouldn't be a stumbling block 
because in fact we all hold in common these 10 extraordinary stories in the New Testament. Let's have a think about each of them. The Annunciation, and tomorrow we're celebrating this feast. It could not be better than thinking about this tonight. Tomorrow is the Feast of the Annunciation. Um, the Annunciation's extraordinary. Don't make Mary or Joseph too old. There's nothing in the text that says they were anything but the normal betrothal ages for first century Palestine. The normal betrothal age we know from both Roman and Jewish historians was 12 to 14. The normal betrothal age for a male was 17 to 19. So split the difference, we have a 13 year old girl and an 18 year old boy. Now a teenage pregnancy, a 13 year old girl pregnant now is a traumatic event. So just revisit that moment. No wonder she was terrified. That's what the text says. The Greek says when the angel came, she was terrified. I think that's a pretty stock standard, pretty good response, just quietly. A 13-year-old and the 18-year-old fiancé knows it's not his child. So he tries to avoid shame until the angel comes in a dream. And then when she gets the invitation to become the mother of God, um, she uh, says that famous yes. Now, the Dominicans and the Jesuits have been fighting about that yes for the last 472 years. You think you have long-standing fights with your neighbours. Come join religious life in the Catholic Church. And it all came down to one question. It's called the debate about free will and grace. Could Mary have said no to the angel? The Dominican tradition is, such as the grace of the Immaculate Conception, Mary had to say yes to the angel because she was primed for it. The Jesuit tradition is, no, there's nothing in the Immaculate Conception that says Mary wasn't fully and truly free. Nothing takes away our freedom. We're never coerced into grace. We're invited into grace, including Mary. So she could have said no, but that makes the yes even better. Now, Pope Clement VII in uh, 1596 said to the Dominicans and the Jesuits, you're both right, now shut up. And the Jesuits are right, of course, there's no question about that. But as soon as she says yes, what's the next thing she does? In Luke's gospel, we get this extraordinary hymn put onto her lips where she's ripping down princes from their thrones and raising up the poor and announcing the year of the Lord's favor. She ain't no plaster saint. She's not Mary meek and mild, strong, a 13 year old who has one of the great statements about how the Lord is now going to turn the world upside down. Wow. And it, as a result, we need to take women's leadership really seriously. I'll be back to that very soon, because she's an incredibly strong woman leader, the first disciple of Christ. The second story we get is all about women too. It's about the visitation. Yeah, absolutely terrific. Now, don't make St. Elizabeth too old. Sometimes we make her 96. Well, most people in Jesus' day were dead by 50. From DNA testing on sarcophagi, from um, Roman census, you remember they had the census, sensi? Well, we know lots of births and dates, and most people were dead by 50. That's why three score and 10 in the Bible is a huge age to get to 70 in Jesus' day. Sort of changes the teaching on marriage, doesn't it? When Jesus says, until death do you part, well, that was only 50 for him. So I think we should keep saying it. I'm not saying we shouldn't, but we often think it's all the same as now. Everyone was dead by, well, a lot of people were dead by 50. So St. Elizabeth was probably 36, maybe going through menopause, and because it came earlier, we know, and, uh, um, uh, and, and as a result, she conceives a child. The story works beautifully about two women meeting, two early disciples of the kingdom of Christ, marvelous. But of course, it's all about the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Covenant, John the Baptist, the last of the prophets, and his mother, and now the fulfillment of all the prophecies, Mary and Jesus meeting. Absolutely extraordinary. So here we are of Elizabeth and Mary as the first, and Joseph being the first three proactive saints in the church in bringing about the kingdom of God. And I think as a result, we need to take women's leadership very, very seriously. Firstly and foremost, I'm not on my own in saying this anymore, I would have women cardinals tomorrow. Firstly, because women look fantastic in red. And secondly, most Catholics don't even know this, 
You don't have to be a priest or be a bishop to be a cardinal. To be a bishop came only in 1960. To be a priest came in 1917. And the College of Cardinals goes back to 1084. For about 900 years, we had laymen and priests as cardinals. Well, now I think we should go back to the older Catholic tradition and have laymen and lay women who are offering leadership to the election of the Bishop of Rome and to the entire church. Because if it was good enough for God to call Mary and Elizabeth to pivotal roles in leadership, it's good enough for us. I love the story of the Texas rancher, the New York stockbroker, and the woman attorney from Los Angeles who died and was standing in line as they were waiting their turn to enter into heaven. St. Peter called the rancher first. We only have one simple requirement for entry into heaven here. You must spell God. And the rancher said G-O-D, and into heaven he went. The next person came along, of course, was the male stockbroker from New York. He, St. Peter said, oh, we only have one uh, requirement here for entry into heaven. You must spell God. He said G-O-D, and in he went. Finally, the woman attorney from Los Angeles turned up. Before St. Peter could speak, she was straight out of the box with her speech. I am so pleased to be in heaven, said the woman attorney from Los Angeles. She said, I am sick of the proverbial glass ceiling and sexism and patriarchy at every turn. I can't tell you, St. Peter, how excited I am to be in heaven where there'll be no more patriarchy or sexism for eternity. To which St. Peter said, well, you'll find none of that around here. For women, you just have to do one simple uh, uh, requirement, spell Czechoslovakia. <laughs> so we need to make sure that the, even the biblical tradition challenges us because, in fact, the two earliest major players in the kingdom of Christ are Mary and Elizabeth. We go to the nativity. Now, do you know how far it is from um, Nazareth to Bethlehem? It's 103 miles. I know nothing about having a baby, but as the story goes, the tradition, Mary gets on a donkey in the last weeks of her pregnancy and has a baby on arrival. I reckon that's going to help the whole process along. I really do. <laughs> if that doesn't break the waters, I don't know what's not going to... Think of getting on a donkey in the last week of your pregnancy and going 103 miles. An extraordinary story. The other couple of details in the story we often miss are these. They were homeless. They were homeless. Boy, that's an important detail. Jesus was not born in a palace as a prince. He was born a homeless person. And where does he end up being born? In a manger. Now, the word manger, actually, we've turned it into some lovely little, uh, you know, outdwelling with lovely straw and everybody mooing and uh, baying. In fact, it was the cave where the animals slept. I think it was pretty smelly and pretty dreadful, actually. We're talking an incredibly poor circumstance in which God decided to enter our world. I love that story. So we have a 13-year-old girl, an 18-year-old fiancé, they're homeless, and they've, they're now in a cave with animals. Oh, I love Christmas. Christmas tells me lots of things, and the first is God's okay with mess. That's pretty messy. All of that is incredibly messy. If you think God is not ready for the mess of your life, go home and read the Christmas story all over again. God's okay with mess. The next story, of course, we hit is the presentation of the child Jesus in the temple. They were devout Jews. It's impossible to be an anti-Semite and to have great devotion to Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Some people say, oh, I don't like the Jews. Oh, they run Hollywood. I don't know. Those Jews have just taken over the whole place. Well, what do you think Mary's religion was? What do we think the Lord was nurtured as a Jewish man? So we have to be very careful of this stuff. You can't be anti-Semitic and have lively devotion to Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. It's impossible. It would be to rob them from their own spiritual heritage. And the church is very strong these days of not doing it. We've talked about the refugee. It's a theological story, but it started the church's whole tradition of being kind and good to refugees. And in your country and mine, immigration can become one of the great hysterical moments for us. Now, okay, we need some border patrol and border protection. I get all of that. But if the Holy Family was coming to Australia, we would put them on a boat and send them back to Indonesia. 
Luckily, they weren't coming to us. So we've got to have a think here, because if you know the story of the Holy Family, then we think, wasn't it wonderful that they actually could take um, good, uh, be in safe place and then return? All right, it's a safe place we've got to think about. And then the next story we get is the losing of the child Jesus in the temple. I love this one. In the text, we're told that it took Mary, jo Mary and Joseph a day to even discover that they'd lost Jesus. Don't you love that? We'd now put them in the Department of Children's Services. <laughs> they don't say, it took them a day to even figure out they didn't have the boy. And of course, its numbers are all, you know, they're theologically, they don't take them literally. One is always the act of God. Three, the third day, it takes them another two to find him. So on the third day, we're fine. They find him back in the temple teaching. And on the third day, he is teaching the, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees. I love that story. And they don't understand what, what he's doing and why he's done it to them. I like that too. Is, for any of us who have ever lost a child in a marketplace or a, a department store, isn't it an exquisite combination of feelings you have when you've lost the child and then you find them again. There's an exquisite combination of you want to love that child and murder that child at exactly the same time. And it seems to be an equal measure. I once lost my niece, my father, my brother's oldest uh, child, Amy. I lost Amy for two hours in a department store. And I wanted to love her and kill her when I found her again. Thanks be to God, I chose the first rather than the second, but there we go. But the losing of the child Jesus in the temple where they didn't understand what he was about and they were lost him. He goes back under their authority until then, the next we hear about his public ministry at 30. Um, we don't often hear about um, Mark chapter three, but uh, it's where Mary goes home to, uh, goes to bring Jesus home. And it's extraordinary because um, Jesus says something quite abrupt, really. He said, I have no um, mother or brothers or sisters, only those who hear the word of God and keep it. He's seemingly rejecting of his family. And uh, we don't often hear this one, and it isn't one that's got into the public imagination, but it's there where Mary is seemingly rejected by the Lord for his ministry. And again, she doesn't quite understand the scandal he is, uh, uh, what he's doing in the local community. And then we go to Cana. Cana's one of my favorites. Now, at the very base, it tells us that Mary and Jesus loved a party. They loved a big, very alcoholic party, as far as I can work out. I'm not making this up. John 2, 6 tells us that Jesus changed the six water jars, which held 20 to 30 gallons. So all up after the miracle, we have 120 to 180 gallons of wine. Now, I've done some research for you this week. Given today's bottles, do you know how many bottles that ends up being? 75 dozen or 900 bottles of wine. I'm going with Mary to the next wedding I go to <laughs> because, my goodness, she loved a party because she's the one who asks for the miracle. Now, and it's not just any old wine. It's not plonk. It's the best wine. In Australia, we have our best wine. Of course, you know, we're famous for our wines. And we have the best wine is a thing called Grange Hermitage, which is a stunning wine. I think I've only had it twice in my life. But it's an absolutely stunning wine. Well, Mary had Grange Hermitage from Jesus, 900 bottles of it at that wedding. But, of course, it's working on a theological level. There are three things about the Cana which make it magnificent. Firstly, where Christ is present... There is no shame. Do you remember? They would have been shamed in the story if they ran out of wine. Even at a wedding now, if you run out of wine, it looks like you're a bit mean. You haven't quite provided for the crowd. And you're a bit money pinching. So it wouldn't be a nice thing even now. Well, it was even worse in Jesus' day. You had to be exceedingly generous to pretty well the whole town who came to all the weddings. The second, so there's no shame. There's only repentance in the life, not shame. Very important point. Secondly, the banquet is always a sign of eternity. And this banquet is now going to last forever because wine in the Old Testament is a sign of joy. And this joy is now a river that flows. Fantastic. So it's a theological story rather than, a well, a, no doubt a literal story too, but it has a great theological meaning as well. Last two, the crucifixion. Sometimes we um, have domesticated the cross a little bit much and I think we should recover its power and its horror. Take Jesus off the cross and put him into the electric chair 
and you've got a mother who watches her son capitally punished. That's what the cross is. It's an instrument of capital punishment used for the worst criminals by the Romans for the worst crime, sedition against the state. That's what Jesus is crucified by, for by Pilate. It was a humiliating death. And every gospel records that his mother was at the foot of that cross. She watched her child capitally punished. That starts to recover that moment, I think. We're coming to Easter. I think we can hold on to it. Imagine if you watched your child strapped to the electric chair or going before a firing squad or about to have a lethal injection. Imagine if you were watching that and you knew he was innocent. Imagine your horror. No plastic saint there. And then finally, we have Pentecost. Pentecost is an extraordinary story where they all, after being so frightened, they then get emboldened by the Spirit to go out and proclaim the good news. And who's there in the center of it? Mary, the mother of Jesus. Mary, the mother of the church, is there in the room when, in fact, they're all sent out on that first great mission. What do we have from all of those stories? Pope Paul VI tells us a couple of things. Firstly, we have a flesh and blood woman who is a full and true human being, who is our mother, our sister, a prophet, and our friend. To reclaim our prayer and our approach to Mary, we need to reclaim sensibly and sanely some wonderful things that we know from her life from the scriptures. Firstly, she was a poor, simple Jewish woman. She was the first and she the preeminent disciple in the kingdom Jesus proclaimed. Without her, yes, Christianity as we know it wouldn't have happened. She has something to say to anybody in our world who is a teenage mother, a poor, hard-working religious person, a refugee, and a so-called person of color. Don't tell some Catholics this, but Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were not white. They were black. And some traditions have got it. The black Madonna tradition keeps us alive to this day. Why does this matter? I know Catholics who go to Mass on Sunday and they're racists on Monday and they cannot see the contradiction. Oh boy, some of us need a little challenging here. Every single holy picture, every single stained glass window, every single uh, um, art that we've ever had or ch generally we've had has had a white Jesus with brown hair and bright blue eyes. I don't think so. It's a European Jesus that went all over the world, understandable. But if we want to go back to the historical Jesus and Mary and Joseph, well, we're looking at people who are as dark-skinned as Moroccans or Ethiopians. Why not the Middle East? Because for a thousand years since the Crusades, we've been intermarrying with Europe and uh, the Middle East, and they've actually been lightening up, not darkening down. So we've got to go to Northern Africa. But the one thing I can tell you with a degree of absolute certainty is Mary, Joseph, and Jesus were not white. And they sure as hell didn't have blue eyes either. So we need to be careful here. So who we pray to sometimes even challenges latent racism that can be in our hearts. Mary knows what it's like to lose a child in a marketplace. And if any of you have ever touched that terrible moment, she knows what it's like to lose a child in death. I recently did the funeral of a 74-year-old woman, uh, a 74-year-old man, and his 94-year-old mother was inconsolable because she said you should never bury your child. Even when you're 94 and he's 74, you should never bury your child. I want to say a quick word about apparitions. Um, and what I'm now giving you is absolutely rock-solid Catholic devotion and uh, teaching, but you may not have heard it before. You can be a Catholic in full and true standing with the church and not believe in a single apparition of Our Lady. That comes in the Vatican document in 1989 about uh, certain questions concerning the apparitions of Our Lady and correct procedures in their regard, quote unquote. So sometimes people say, oh, you've got to believe in that. Well, you don't have to believe in it. Yeah, you'd be a bit crazy not to. Popes, saints, doctors of the church have found great devotion, great help and assistance in the spiritual life. Okay. But some people find it very difficult. I've actually known people who can't enter the church through the RCIA because I get all for everything about the church, but not all the Marian apparition stuff, so I can't become a Catholic. The church actually teaches their secondary elements to faith not primary elements to faith. 
the old line holds true. If it helps, do it. If it doesn't, don't. There's a piece of spiritual sanity this late Lent. If it helps, do it. I'm delighted when people have great devotion to Our Lady under any apparition or any place. Terrific. But don't tell anybody else you have to do it to be a good Catholic or otherwise. You do not. They're secondary devotions, not primary to the faith. The creed is primary to our faith. I want to finish my entire presentation tonight by telling you a story which is all about uh, how I came back to having a very lively devotion to Mary, the mother of God. But I want to start with being an eight-year-old. When I was in my Catholic grade school run by the Sisters of Mercy, my music teacher was a wonderful woman called Sister Mary Wenceslaus. Didn't the nuns have fantastic names? Sister Mary Wenceslaus. In fact, my grade four teacher was Sister Mary Ethelberger. Who thought that was a good idea? What did we call her behind her back? Sister Mary Cheeseburger, of course. And Sister Mary Wenceslaus came into my class one day and taught us that 12th century stunning piece of Gregorian chant, a, a love song basically to Mary called the Salve Regina. And we sing it in the church to this day. Hold that thought for the moment. On the 15th of August, 1975, the entire parish council of a parish that was in the hill country outside uh, in the mountains behind Santiago in Chile were arrested by the military police. For months, the villagers tried to find out where their men had gone, why they'd been taken away, and what they'd ever done to be arrested in the first place. They were actually accused of being terrorists and of organizing trade unions. They were unashamedly guilty of the second, because it happens to be Catholic teaching, the right of workers not to be exploited, but they were certainly not terrorists. In December of that year, word arrived that the corpses of the eight men could be reclaimed from Santiago's morgue. My cousin, Catherine, was a nun working in that village at that time. She was also a doctor, and she ran the local um, health clinic for the entire region. And the eight mothers asked Catherine in her truck, which was the most reliable in the village, to drive, her, uh, drive them down into Santiago to be able to reclaim their dead sons. Catherine later wrote this to me in a letter. Richard, you couldn't imagine what we found when we got to this morgue, if indeed you could use the morgue, the word morgue, to describe it. There were 100 corpses piled high up on each other. It was a blisteringly hot day, no refrigeration, no air conditioner, but one ceiling fan. There were no records, and our mothers had to roll somebody else's son over in an attempt to find her own. And as one mother found her son, and then another, and then another, they called out more desperately in a way I'd never heard before. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. The letter continued. For years I rejected the devotion to Mary because I felt oppressed by the way generations of men in the church presented her. Blue veils, white skin always smiling, a perpetual virgin yet also a mother, an ideal I could never achieve, but one especially as a religious woman in the church I was told I should be aspiring toward. But in the experience of those village mothers that day in that morgue, the distortions of who Mary was for a poor and suffering world just faded away. Far from feeling distant from their devotion, I found myself praying with them knowing that Mary was one with us right at that moment in our shock, anger, and grief. The letter went on. What happened next is so indescribable that I assume you think I'm making it up. When we got the nine boys out onto the pavement, I brought my truck around. Around 20 to 30 soldiers, young men, stood by and watched nine women load eight corpses into my truck. Not one of them lifted a finger to help us. We could only get seven out of the eight into the back frame of the truck. So one of the mothers had to cradle her dead son in her arms in the front with me. The journey back to our village from Santiago takes about four hours. And on the long trip up into the mountains, we all prayed the rosary again and again 
and again. For as the mother next to me said at one stage, we have to pray the rosary with Mary at times like this because she knows what it's like to bring a child into this world and claim his dead body in her arms. And there it was, right next to me. Twelve years later, in 1989, my cousin Catherine died of hepatitis in that village. As a doctor, she knew how sick she was, but she lied to her family and her provincial superior about how ill she was because she was frightened if she was taken away from that village where she'd lived now for almost 27 years, she would never get back. But they were her people, this was her land, and if she dies, she dies. The only consolation my uncle and aunt got was when a letter arrived from the village mothers. I had it translated from Spanish into English for them, and this is what it said. We want, you to be, we want you to know that we were with your daughter Catherine Life last night when she died. We would never have let her die alone, for she was one of our children too. We've often prayed the rosary with her. She seemed to like that, particularly in recent weeks when she's been going in and out of delirium, thumbing the beads she's used ever since she brought us back with our boys from the capital all those many years ago. In fact, we've buried her in the midst of our sons in our local cemetery, and we put on her tombstone the line she asked us to inscribe, Mary, my friend, my companion and mother of the poor, pray for me. In 2010, I was the first member of Catherine's family to go to that village and stand at her grave. There was an international Jesuit communications meeting we had one day off from the conference, and I knew exactly where I had to go. I boarded a bus at 6 a.m. in Santiago, and about four and a half hours later, there were five of eight living mothers, five of them still living, waiting for the bus to arrive. They immediately took me by the hand, and we went straight to the cemetery. And there I found four young men's graves on that side, four young men's graves on that side. Not one of them was older than 29 years of age. And in the middle was Catherine. I was the first flesh of her flesh and bone of her bone to stand at that grave. I have no Spanish, or very little Spanish. The best I've got is, lo siento no hablo espanol. That's as good as it gets. They had very little English. But one of the women had a little broken English and she said, Father, say a prayer. Well, I didn't have any Spanish for a prayer. They didn't have any English and I didn't know what to do. And then like a, a wise a steward who brings out things new and old out from our Catholic tradition came screaming and flooding back to me. Sister Mary Wenceslaus. So I said, bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And I did this. Salve Regina, Mata Misericordiae, Vita Dulce do Hespes Nostra Salve. A te clamamus, exoles filieve, A te suspiramus, gementes et flentes, In hac lacrimarum vale. Ea ego advocata nostra, hilos tuos misericordes oculos, ad nos converte. Et Jesum benedictum fructum ventris tui, nobis post hoc exilium ostende. O Clemens, O Pia, O Dulcis, Vigo Maria. When I opened my eyes and I'd heard with my ears, as soon as I started singing that 12th century Gregorian love song to Mary, Five Spanish women joined in. Who could have thought that an Irish nun 
in Australia was going to give something so rich about our tradition, it was going to unite a Jesuit priest and five grieving mothers in a cemetery four and a half hours from Santiago in Chile. That's why now is not the time to flow out, throw out our devotion to Mary. Not the time at all. It's the time to reclaim it as sane and sensible, coherent, wonderfully in touch with history, and one that can be adaptable, that can be deeply human, and can be utterly Catholic if we let it. The last thing I did at that grave was one very important thing, just on my own. I went back later after having lunch before the 2.30 bus back to the capital. I stood there on my own, and I remembered a wonderful moment at Uncle Morris's place when I was about eight years of age, and Catherine, who was a much older cousin than me, was about to go to medical school. And knowing that if Catherine isn't in heaven, there's not much hope for me, I looked at her grave and said, Catherine, say g'day to Jesus. <laughs> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, just quickly, I, Josh, is there hospitality now? There is. He, upstairs. There's a room upstairs, and that's where we're going to have hospitality. I think we've run out of books. They've already sold out, but there are more coming tomorrow. I wrote that chapter up about Mary in my book, Why Bother Praying? So if you'd like to buy that book tomorrow, um, all of what you've heard tonight, or even more, long play version in there. Tomorrow night, we're going to look at how do we make good decisions? How does our own Christian faith help us apply in our family, our workplace, and in our nations to make the best decisions we can? Safe home and God bless.